fellow citizens of India, 59 years back, 15th August 1947, we all think a very great thing happened. Before that, for 90 years, there was a fight for Swaraj, a battle for Swaraj. And if a lot of you would recall, in 90 years back, Lokman Nirtelak in Pune had in ringing tones made a statement that has become part of our history. He said, Swaraj Maja Janma Siddha Hakkai Ani Tomi Melavnaras. And we say Swaraj came. A question I'd like to pose before all of you is, are you happy with the state of governance in the country today? Can I get an answer? No. Anybody who thinks that he's happy with the state of governance? No. Okay. If you say you are unhappy with the state of governance in the country, Swaraj means my Raj. So are you saying you are unhappy with your own Raj? You don't like your own rule? Is I don't like my own rule. I don't want somebody else ruling over me. Where does my solution lie? My submission to you is Swaraj never really came. It is an illusion and a delusion. Swaraj did not come on 15th August 1947. What happened was there was a transfer of Raj from one set of rulers, the whites, to the browns. This is what truly happened on 15th August 1947 and that is why we are unhappy. If we had Swaraj, we would be a very different kind of state. But we say we are a democracy. We have elections, we have a constitution. So how is it that Swaraj is not there? In a democracy, it is a rule of the people, for the people, by the people. I would submit to you that we have missed an essence of Swaraj, the essence of democracy. What we have today is an elective democracy. A democracy where you have a constitution, you have elections. Elections and a constitution are necessary conditions for a democracy. But by themselves, they do not become a complete set of conditions for a democracy or for Swaraj. The essence of democracy is that an individual, one individual is sovereign. This is the true essence of democracy which we have missed. You, an individual, are sovereign and you give up part of your sovereignty to the state in respect, in return for which you get the rule of law. That is the essence of democracy. You may wonder, what is right to information? Right to information is the enforceable right of citizens to get information about government and governance. Sounds extremely simple. And it looks as if it's come newly to us. We've all heard of it in the last couple of years only. I heard of it first, just three years back, as a right proper. So it looks as if the government has given us a new right. The fact is, the right existed the day the constitution of India was framed. Right to information is a fundamental right of citizens. How come we didn't know? 1975, in the Rad Narayan case, the Supreme Court ruled, we are all aware that under Article 19.1, freedom of expression is a very important right for all of us. We hold it very dear. But the Supreme Court said, how can citizens express themselves meaningfully about government and governance if they are not informed? If you do not have information, how will you express yourself meaningfully? You can express yourself, but it is not meaningful expression. Also, if the government is mine, the government belongs to me, every table, chair, tube light in the government belongs to us, to all of us. It does not mean we take them away. But then obviously the information there is mine. It, it, I, it, I own it. In my own house, if I have a drawer and I have papers in it, can somebody refuse to allow me to see it? Question is no. It is my right to see them because it belongs to me. The money is ours. The account for the money should be with us. Just to give you a historic background, this the first movement in India, his, worldwide in fact, the first Freedom of Information Act was enacted in Sweden in 1766, 240 years back. And you will probably recognize that Sweden is one of those countries where human rights and democracy is at its peak compared to most other countries. Last 60, 70 years, it's become a worldwide movement. And in India, for the last 15, 20 years, there has been talk of right to information. 
the first movement, actual movement for right to information took place in Rajasthan about 14 years back. Villages of Rajasthan undertook this movement, mind you. It wasn't city bred people, it was not educated people, it was villagers who started this movement and then it kept on growing. Nine states had enacted the Right to Information Act in the last five, six years and last year, 12th October 2005, the National Act for Right to Information has become an enforceable right. But I said it's part of a fundamental right. So what is new? What is this new law really doing? We had the right, but it was difficult to enforce this right. The Right to Information Act codifies this right and makes it possible for us to enforce this right. Freedom of the press is considered important for a democracy so that the citizen can be informed. That is the reason why freedom of the press is considered is very important. But then it stands to reason that if my right to be informed is the basis of freedom of the press, then my right to inform comes first, freedom of the press comes next. If we start understanding this fundamental concept that our right to be informed is more important than freedom of the press also, and you need no locus standi. You do not need to explain why you want information. Just similarly, under right to information, it's your right to be informed. And that is what it does. Who can get right to information? All citizens of India are eligible to get right to information. All citizens. Companies, NGOs, firms cannot. But every individual citizen has the right to get information. Where will I get information from and who has to give the information? The Act defines what are called public authorities. Public authorities have been defined as all administrative units of government bodies. So each administrative unit is a public authority. Let's say a large police station is a public authority. The IITs are public authorities. All things owned by central government including public sector undertakings, they are public authorities. Also, the Act says anything substantially controlled or financed by government is a public authority. Therefore, aided schools, colleges become public authorities, nationalized banks, unit trust of India, LIC, these are all public authorities. They have to appoint a public information officer. He is not somebody specifically appointed for this at this moment. He or she is somebody who is already doing some other job and is given the job of also holding this and giving information to the citizens. Citizens will ask for information with some fees. By and large, in most parts of the country, the fee is 10 rupees application fee. So with 10 rupees, you apply and ask for information from the public information officer of a particular public authority. How do I find out who the public information officer is? I don't need to find out. I just have to identify the public authority which is concerned with whatever matter I am talking about. So I apply to the public information officer, that particular authority or institution and ask for information with my 10 rupee fee. Within 30 days, this public information officer has to give me the information. If he doesn't have it, him, no, no, nobody in an organization will have all the information. He or she would ask somebody else and whoever is asked becomes the deemed public information officer for the purpose of the act. In 30 days, the information must be provided. So you would all say we have known of all these laws. Nothing works in India, does it? This is some hocus pocus. One more promise which will not ever fructify. Why it works is in 30 days if the information is not provided, then there is a provision for a penalty of 250 rupees per day on the public information officer payable from his or her own salary. This is the teeth of the act. This is what makes the act work. And this goes far beyond the Right to Information Act. So far, think of it, there is nothing, no matter how major a disaster, where you can hold a public servant accountable. No matter what happens, if something affects 10,000 lives, one public servant cannot be held accountable. Here, the concept of the sovereignty of the individual has been reinforced. You, a sovereign, ask a question, 
and if the public servant does not reply, he or she is liable to pay a penalty of 250 rupees per day from their salary, personally liable. RT application reaches the public information officer, that is day one, not when I make it. When it has reached the public information officer, that is day one. Then supposing in 15 days, the public information officer decides to give me the information, he or she will send an ordinary letter and a postal certificate to me. The clock stops, so it is day 15. The letter takes me four days to reach. After four days, supposing I pay the money after another 15 days, the clock is zero until this whole period. It's still at 15. The clock starts again when I pay the money. There is an additional fee which one has to pay to get the information. The fee is typically 2 rupees per A4 size pay. For a CD, it's about 50 rupees in most states. This, there are some variations in the fees from state to state and the central government, but by and large, this is the fee. For an A4 size paper, 2 rupees per pay. And for a CD, 50 rupees or 100 rupees. These are the standard fees that you have to pay. So once you pay the fees, then you are eligible to get the information. If you are not happy with the decision of the public information officer, then there is a process for a first appeal and then a second appeal can be filed. Each state can have its own rules. The act is common. Act defines everything. But for the process of how the fees are to be paid, what are the fees and how is the appeal process, this each state has been given the right to frame separately. Maharashtra, for example, the appeal fees is 10 rupees. There is a format that you have to follow. The format, index A, see rule 3. Can you see a concrete example of how this was used by somebody? The question of garbage not getting cleared. Who is the public authority responsible for this? The Municipal Corporation of Bombay. What is the administrative unit of the Municipal Corporation? The ward office. So they addressed it to the public information officer, so and so ward, assistant commissioner and the address. On top you write format of application under Right to Information Act 2005, Appendix C, C Rule 3. This is the format. Where do you take a plain piece of paper? You can do it handwritten, you can do it on a computer, you can do it on a typewriter. The Act has specified that nobody can insist that a form is required. This has been specified in the Act itself. Now, this is the format for Maharashtra. Central government has no format. Some states have format, some don't. You would have to look at the rules of a particular state. And to access the rules of all these states, you can take a look at this website, www.satyamevajayate.info. This would give you rules of each state, which would tell you what the fees, etc. are. To come back to this format for Maharashtra, you address this to the public information officer, full name of applicant. I repeat, individual citizen, any citizen can apply. You don't need local standing. So your name, address, your address, particulars of the information required, subject matter of information. Now in the case of garbage, these citizens said, clearance of garbage on street so and so. That is all they said. Next is period to which information relates. They said current. Sometimes you want information 5 years back, 10 years back or statistical information of what's happened in the last 50 years and so on. Then you put that period. Description of information required. This is the key that determines how your thing will work. These citizens asked, they said, on so and so street, we want the schedule of clearing of garbage on which day and what time is garbage to be cleared. Question two, we want the name and designation of the officer responsible for clearance of garbage. You can begin to understand what happens when such a question is asked and if it has to be answered, what will happen? Okay, this, whether information is required by post or in person, for most people who can afford it, I would suggest in by post, the cost is not more than about 20-25 rupees, getting it in post. If by post registered, ask for it by registered post. Whether applicant is below poverty line, this is for those who are below poverty line, there are no fees to be paid. For most of your cases, the answer would be no. If somebody is below poverty line, then he or she has to attach a Xerox copy, place, let us say Mumbai or whichever city you are in or whichever town, date, signature of applicant. They are extremely simple format to follow. For Maharashtra government, you can pay the fee by getting a court fee stamp of 10 rupees. This is a 10 rupee court fee stamp, which you can get outside most courts and at stamp vendors. 
stick it on your application and that is it. You can pay this fees for central government bodies incidentally the court fee stamp does not work. Uh, there are 600 post offices across India. In Mumbai GPO counter 15 you can go and there are 9 other post offices. Again the addresses of these are given on this website. You can sit at your own house, make it, send it by registered post, send it by registered AD. You will get your acknowledgement that is adequate proof. If in 35 days for some reason he has not answered you, there is an appeal format, you will get it in the rules of Maharashtra, file your appeal according to that. Do not go anywhere. You do not call up any public information officer, do not go and ask him for anything. You are exercising the majesty of the Indian citizen, you are not a beggar. Please do not go and beg anywhere and the act works, believe me it works. The 10 rupee fees can also be paid at the ward office? Yes, it can. Okay. okay. The, the pro provisions are you can pay it in cash at that office, you can pay it by demand draft, you can pay it by an Indian postal order. That's These three options are always open. I just feel that this is a more convenient way of doing it because sometimes when you go to a ward office, the cashier may not be there, you may have to wait, etc. There are 10 post offices in Bombay that have been designated and 600 across India. I am just giving GPO as one example of uh, one of the post offices that is this cost for CD and so on that you mentioned yes sir that comes later or yeah so what happens is say after 15 days the PIO says I am going to give you information if it's you ask for copies supposing it is 50 copies then he will say 50 into 200 rupees typical information that you ask will be usually 4 5 10 pages so it will be 10 pages into 2 please pay 20 rupees if you ask for the information by registered post he will say 25 rupees for registered post please pay 45 rupees that is the time somebody has to go to that office and pay the money alternately you can also remit the money by money order you can actually do the whole process just sitting at home that's the beauty of this and it will work first question why would somebody like to be a public information officer they each public authority has to do it uh, to your next question which was can it be misused? Now this is a question that is very often asked. Let us pause for a while. What is information? Information is something that exists. Which means it is truth. By and large, would we believe that truth would hurt? By and large, would we believe that truth can lead to something bad? I am not saying there can be no case. There is, I, I repeat, there is no activity in human endeavor where there can be no misuse. Somebody will always find one way of misusing it. I, I completely agree there. But that does not stop us from doing everything. Why do we do all this? We have laws, we have various things and everything is misused. So the potential for misuse always exists. But by and large, the belief is that truth will sanitize. Truth will only be good for everybody. Truth will be good for the entire society. That is the fundamental belief. Okay, come back. You'd say very well, I can get information, it's very easy. But so what? What will I do with information? Uh, in the case of garbage, as I told you, they put these two questions and next day onwards, their garbage started getting cleared properly because they realized that providing these answers, now accountability is getting fixed. One of the most powerful cases of use of right to information that I've come across in my career is, it happened three years back, the Maharashtra Act was there, which is similar to the National Act. January 2004, this very young boy from Bihar, aged 22 years, his educational qualification, 7th standard, who came to Mumbai looking for a job. Where did he stay? In a Jopar Patti. He had some people from his village, so he went and put his small bundle there. And while he was going around looking for a job, there was a good RTI workshop being held. A good RTI workshop incidentally is about one and a half to two hours. He understood that he didn't need a form, understood that he had, could put a 10 rupee court fee stamp and so on. And having understood this, he moved on, got a job and after that he needed something which all of us do. All citizens feel they do, without it you feel as if you know you have no identity, a ration card. So he also said I need a ration card, he went to a rationing office, filled up his form. As he was going out, the pune followed him and the pune at the door asked him, he said, do you want a ration card? He said, yes, that is why I have come here. So the pune said, chai pani lagega. This young lad said, thik hai, aapko chai pila denge. 
So the student said, no, no, chai pani does not mean chai pilana. So he said, what do you mean? He said, you'll have to pay 2,000 rupees. This young boy made a statement which I think makes me feel at times ashamed, at times very proud. He said, I shall not give a bribe. Main ghus nahi dunga. A lot of us would find it difficult to make such a bold statement. And he went, the pune went back. When he went back, his neighbors asked him what had occurred and he described. So they said, friend, without paying, you will not get your ration card. I mean, you can wait interminably and you will need a ration card. So some people said, why don't you go and bargain? If you go and bargain, they'll bring it down. You know, if you bargain well, somebody said you can bring it down to 1500 rupees. This chap repeated the same story. He says, no, I will not pay. Others, someone else suggested, they said, look, it's very good to say that you will not pay corruption and not pay a bribe. But you need a ration card. So do one thing, go and cry before them. Go and cry before the saab there, catch his feet. And tell him how your mother has got cancer, the roof has fallen down on your heart. And then they will take pity on you. When they take pity, they will bring it down further. Up to 800 rupees, we've heard that a ration card has been given. At less than 800 rupees, there is no way you can get a ration card. This man again said no. He started finding out in large bastis in these Jopar Pattis, incidentally some of you may not know, some of these Jopar Pattis have 20, 30, 40,000 people and people keep coming from villages regularly. So the need for ration card is a routine affair. He asked others and discovered that they were all getting their ration cards in 3, 4, 5 weeks. 4 weeks was the average. He waited 8 weeks doing nothing. At the end of 8 weeks, he took that format took a plain piece of paper and wrote on that to the public information officer, so-and-so rationing office, put his name, etc. And description of information, he said, I want these two informations. Number one, I made an application for a ration card on so-and-so date, Xerox copy of receipt attached. I want to know the progress of my file, on which date, which officer had my file, what action did he or she take on the file and then to whom did it move? Question 2. In the last 4 months, I want a list of people who applied for ration cards, dates on which they applied for ration cards and dates on which the ration cards were given to them. Now, we can all understand that if this information was to be provided, it would cause a major problem for them. So the next day, the pun came and told him, he went to the office, got his ration card. And what to me is more important or equally important is, he got a cup of tea and a glass of water. <laughs> he got chai pani. And to me, this cup of tea and glass of water represents respect to the sovereign individual citizen of India. One citizen exercised his right under right to information. And the public servant, who would never have even bothered to look at him, said, please sit down, I'll give you a cup of tea. But he did? Yes, sir. He didn't get the information. Well, I do not know what happened in his case. Legally, you're, uh, to answer this, I know of another instance in Pune, there's a friend called Vijay Kumbhar, last this October, around Diwali time, he was not getting a gas cylinder because his wife said the gas cylinders are being sold in black to the hotels and the residential consumers don't get it unless they pay some black money. So he said, okay, who does a cylinder come from Hindustan Petroleum in his case? So he said, public information officer, Hindustan Petroleum. And he said, for this so-and-so dealer, I want an account for the last two months of cylinders supplied to him, where have they gone and copies of all the bills. Now, if this were to be given, it would again have exposed what was happening. One o'clock, Vijay Kumar went to that HP office, gave his application. Three o'clock, the dealer with one man and the cylinder were at his house. And they said, no, no, please never, sir, whenever you want, you just call me. I will come running. They gave the cylinder. Vijay Kumar took the cylinder, but he said, I will still get the information. Your right to information still remains. He took the information. And last I heard, he was making moves to get the dealer's license cancelled. So your right to information remains. It's just that a lot of citizens quite often are quite happy when their job gets done. Cases like this of getting ration cards 
passports where passports are not being given, income tax refunds, sales tax refunds, pensions, PF, gratuity dues, these are lots of these. I mean, you can keep on counting and they have been done across India. Yeah, by land documents. Land documents, documents. absolutely. People, even in villages, who probably just know how to use a thumb, somebody helps them. The law, in fact, says that the public information officer, if somebody cannot write, must help him to write. But that is still in the dream stages. I think it will take us some years before we get there. But certainly this is what works. Let me, let me go back and explain. Information is what exists. In Marathi, I call information ATM. Ahit Timbilen. There is no perspectives. The PIO has no perspective to offer. If you say, for example, why don't you do like this? Supposing this ration card case, this boy had asked, why don't you give me a ration card? It would not be information. There is no issue. Of, he only said, I want progress. Now, that is information that exists in the office. There is no issue of different perspectives. You think of anything where it is information which exists in the office, there is no two perspectives. You are saying that information exists, please let me know. So therefore, it is not subject to individual subjectivity or perspectives. It is only what exists that has to be given. Ahiti Milaj, this uh, seems to be undefined with respect to employees of the organizations. So if you are a member of Hindustan Petroleum and you were to ask that question, uh, would that uh, sovereign right be still valid for that employee? Absolutely, or? absolutely. So long as you are a citizen of India. In fact, what's happened funnily is that uh, about not exact percentage is not available, but very significant, probably between 20 and 40 percent of the usage is by the employees for redressing things like this promotions, transfers, pensions, salaries, salary arrears. And I have had instances where I have been giving a talk and somebody gets up, one lady stood up the other day and said, I was not getting my salary arrears of something which I had left, some school or something. I filed a right to information application and I got my salary arrears. So this has been used extensively by employees of the organization themselves also, which is perfectly all right. I mean, it will be used in both ways. One is for personal, because you are redressing a personal grievance, which is what really democracy is about. But also, let me give you a few larger cases of usage of uh, what I call public interest. One of my own cases was uh, last year, uh, probably most of you will recall the case of police constable More having raped a minor at Manin Drive. This was in April last year. People were aghast, very understandably so. April 29, Times of India had a news item on page 1 splashed there, which said that citizens had demonstrated the earlier day to say that the government must hold this man accountable, must, uh, More must be punished and so on. On page 6 was a small news item which said as follows. It talked of police inspector Prakash Avare. This was police constable. It said police inspector Prakash Avare of Bombay police raped a minor in September 2004. All the medical records, all the evidence was clear as to what had occurred. In December, he was suspended from service. In December 2004, the case came up in court. Victim turned hostile, which is quite common when they come from poor families. The case was dismissed by the court. Worse still, within six months of the event, that is in March 2005, police inspector Prakash Avare's suspension had been revoked. And in April 2005, Police Inspector Prakash Avare was back in service. He was working as an inspector. And we were talking about a police constable. What could I do? Right to information. I filed a right to information application to the public information officer, Police Commissioner of Mumbai, Crawford Market, etc. I enclosed the cutting and I said, I am referring to this Prakash Avare. And in this case, I said, the, the first question came out of anger. I want to do something. It's natural. You, 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 know, you say, how do I use this and shake him up? So the first question I asked was, I said, I want a copy of the, a Xerox copy of the chart sheet, FIR and medical report. Then I sat and thought for a while. If they give it to me, what will I do with it? I mean, there will be a medical report, there will be a chart sheet, there will be a FIR. What am I going to prove? Then the next question occurred to me. I am 
telling you this because it is the process of how you ask questions. So, next question I asked was, I said I want a copy of the letter revoking Prakash Avare's suspension. Now, what I realize is if they had to give me that letter, it would reveal the name of a top police official who had revoked the suspension and therefore, one could hold him accountable. Now, this was extremely sensitive. So, they rejected my application frivolously. I filed an appeal and uh, now you do not have to go for an appellate hearing, but you have an opportunity of being heard. So, there was a very senior police officer who was there. He said, Mr. Gandhi, what you are saying is right. This is very bad. So, I said, then why are you hiding this? I am as a citizen helping you to correct a wrong. Uh, they did not give me the information again on this particular case, but in August 2005, May 2nd, 2005, I filed my RT application. August 2005, the police has given it to me in writing that in July 2005, police inspector Prakash Avare was dismissed from service. That is the power of right to information that any individual citizen sitting in their own houses can exercise. But did you get the information? I did not. As I said, I, I could have pursued. No, I could have pursued. My right still remained. Question is, you look at an overall, I mean, let us say I have so much time. So, I am trying to pursue certain objectives and then I realize that I would have to put in too much effort to get the information out. But I look at it like this that in most cases the past wrongs are difficult to correct. People will defend, people will dig in. If somebody is lied, he is going to try and defend and the amount of time I will spend trying to get it out. But can I correct the future, which quite often I can? You need not fear. Fear is more in our minds. In my right to information applications, I have uh, challenged the public, uh, the Prime Minister of India, the Chief Minister, the Director General of Police, the Police Commissioner of Bombay, BMC, Land Mafia, Mill Lands, you name it, it is there. And nobody has ever threatened me. I am not saying it cannot happen. Well, if I go out on the road, there is a chance I can get killed. Ten people are killed on the trains of Bombay every day. So, something like that, chance is always there. But by and large, unless you make it into a personal vendetta, I think the chances are not there. I mean, I am one example, nobody has ever bothered to threaten me, though I have been taking up some fairly high profile kind of cases. Uh, Crawford Market is a case I wanted to, or let me take another one, lease lands. We say we are poor, the state is poor, the government has no money, we are all very poor. I would submit to you that we are really rich and I will prove that to you. Under right to information, I obtained information that lot of public lands, lands that belong to all of us are given on lease. Fair enough. If you give something on lease to me for 5 years, after 5 years what will you do? You will say either raise the rent to today's rent or please get out. Extremely simple commercial transaction. The government does not do this. In the island city of Bombay, I have got documentary evidence of 900 acres of land where leases have expired. Leases were given for 5 years, 10 years, 50 years, 99 years, leases expire and no lease renewal is done. To just give you one or two examples of what it means, simplex mills in the heart of Bombay, 7800 square meter plot lease expired in 1983. They continue there. What is the legal status? Illegal occupiers. The government allows that. What is the lease rent they pay per year? 48 rupees and 81 paise per year. 48 rupees and 81 paise for 7,800 square meters. Shapurji Palanji amongst the 10 richest people in India. 25,000 square meters leases expired. They pay 1,600 rupees per year as rent for 25,000 square meters. My computation shows that presently, that is in 2007, the total public loss of revenue for Bombay city alone is over 8,000 crores. Stretched over Maharashtra, it is likely to be 20 to 25,000 crores. Maharashtra is in debt of 1,20,000 crores. Do I have to be in debt? I do not have to be in debt. And this money, it is not taxpayers money, it is, it belongs to the poorest man in Maharashtra who could actually be starving to death. Six and a half thousand children die of malnutrition. To me, the picture of this is 
this is morsels being taken away from the poorest little child who then goes and dies. It, it's sin. It's something unacceptable. And right to information, lots of us will start using. The 5000 crore scam in the municipal markets of Bombay, which last year, using right to information, I was able to expose and it stopped. Two months back, the municipal corporation has stopped that. Though the chief minister had accepted this, the improvements committee of the corporation had accepted this, the fact that the citizen brings out this data is able to stop this. So this is an extremely powerful right. And the beauty is you can do it sitting in your own house at a very small cost. The cost is what? Total cost typically is between 50 to 100 rupees. Time taken, about one hour. Do you need to go anywhere? No. Do you need to call up anybody? No. Do you need to follow up anything? No. At best, if you don't get an answer or you get a rejection, file an appeal. Is all information given to you? There are some exemptions which have been given in the booklets given to you. There are 10 exemption clauses. But by and large, most information is available to us. We just need to begin to use this. If you don't use it, then it's a dead act. We've seen is everybody talks of transparency. Actually, right to information is part of transparency and honesty, revealing. Uh, but uh, as I've told others, everybody like, I mean the men particularly, like others' wives to wear transparent clothes. <laughs> they don't want to be transparent. Now, when the act was signed by the President of India, in three days, he sent a letter to the Prime Minister saying, communication between President and Prime Minister should be exempt. The Prime Minister said, no, 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 they cannot be exempt. But he is also a bureaucrat. So after 20 days, they said, file notings must be exempt. And so on and so forth. Everybody, the Supreme Court of India, which said this is a fundamental right of citizens, has said we should be exempt. The High Court of Bombay, uh, High Court of Maharashtra, refused to even entertain RTI applications for one year. And they have now come out with a set of rules which are completely perverse. We are fighting those battles. The unfortunate part is we have all become used to the concept that we need not be transparent, we need not be honest. However, this is a Citizens Act. And if we mobilize ourselves, the cabinet had decided to dilute the act about three months back. And Citizens Action was able to stop that. And Citizens Action can stop that. No government can dare touch this if we are united in this resolve, simple resolve, that we will not allow any dilution of our freedom. If we do that, we will retain it. If we do not use it, yes, the act will be there away. I do not deny that. But I am saying today we have an extremely powerful tool that is being used extensively across the country by villagers, by city bred people. And as more and more of us start using it, sitting in our own homes at our own times, first week of every month, if you just take a decision that I will make one RTI application. About what? And I don't have time is what a lot of people say. A survey of mine shows that all Indian citizens crib for 10 hours every month. About what is wrong? This is wrong, that is wrong, roads, prime minister, system of election, direct mayor, president, so on and so forth. Sort of Gaguli, absolutely, absolutely. My suggestion is, if it's good for your health, continue cribbing for 9 hours every month. One hour on one of the issues that you are cribbing about, make a vow, first week of every month, you will file one right to information application. Even if you don't pursue appeals, I mean, if you do, it'd be very good. The very fact that you ask impacts governance. There are a lot of cases of this nature where seeing one is to one correlation between the RTI question and the answer, like in the Vijay Kumar case or the rationing card or the Prakash Avray case, my guess is happens in about 10% of the cases, 5 to 10%. In another 25-30%, you impact the governance structure. Even if they have done something wrong, next time they do not want to do that because they are scared, they are afraid about it. So you begin to impact the governance structure. Therefore, roughly in about 30 to 40 percent of the cases, 35, 40 percent, you do impact the governance structure. Simple dream is, when you have to get together, even 20 of us, it is difficult. Sitting in my own house, issue is yours. 
whatever you feel passionate about, whatever you feel passionate about, whatever you feel is important, issue is yours. Sitting in your own house, file one RT application, first week of every month. If he can get 15 to 20 lakh citizens across India, which is not a big figure, mind you, 15 to 20 lakhs of us regularly using right to information as a tool for better governance, as a tool to redress our own problems, as a tool to ensure that somebody else's injustice is removed. Two crore times a year, we start asking questions. We can change the face of governance in India. Some people have told me, I've, I've had, of course, I get a mix of reactions. Some, I, I was at Delhi yesterday and there, there were people from rural uh, Uttar Pradesh. Some of them had heard this talk eight months earlier. And they were very thrilled. They said, Mr. Gandhi, after hearing your talk, we filed some 150 applications in that area. And out of that, in 60 cases, we've had problem resolutions. So I think it's fantastic. But in some cases, it may not. Don't look at it as your individual success. Look at it as a process. So I'm saying 15 to 20 lakhs of us. Just decide. It's not difficult. At our own houses, in three to five years, the face of governance will change. Some people say, but I can't see the result. How do I know? To them I say, a lot of us go to mandirs, masjids, gurudwaras, churches, once a week, once a month, whenever, depending on beliefs. When someone goes there and comes out, does something fall into the pocket? Nothing does. Then why do people do it? They do it as an act of faith. They have faith that by going there, something good will happen. What do we do as an act of faith for the nation? Nothing. Can we do this simple act as an act of faith for our nation? And I can assure you, you can logically see that yes, it can have an impact. I mean, this is not like a Jadu Mantar that is being told to the nation. In the US, a citizen just picks up the phone and he or she gets the answer. Yet, the act came there in 1966. In 2002, there were over 2 million applications. In 2003, there were over 3 million applications. In 2004, there were over 4 million applications. So, it, the worldwide experience has been that wherever it is implemented, because it becomes a citizen's thing. In various places, citizens start and the empowerment it gives you. You know, you see that the government shakes. The, that Bihari boy, he got a cup of tea. Just imagine the empowerment he must have felt. Somebody who nobody looked at, he is asked to sit down. The em citizen empowerment is phenomenal in this, absolutely phenomenal. And it's got to be seen to be believed. And this helps you exercise the power of one. Please understand critically, I repeat, unless we start believing that the individual is sovereign of this nation, it will not work. This democracy is a concept of we the people, not as a mass, we the people individually. Individually, when we talk of we the people, it is not as a mass of people, it's we individually. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, do we have any right and procedure to just cross-check that the information provided to us is correct or not? Yes, very good question. You can actually ask for an inspection of files. Right to information gives you access to asking for records, asking for copies. You also have the right to inspect files. So if you suspect that some information given to you is wrong, you can then say, I want to inspect those files. This can be done on the same, same application? No. You, well, you can... If you like, you can first ask for an inspection also. Your first application can be, I want inspection of documents. You can have a separate one saying, I want this information. That is possible. On the same application, both will not work. You will have to have two different applications. But you can ask for inspection. Right to information also entitles you to ask for samples. You can ask for samples of whatever drugs that you suspect are bad, food grains, road concrete core from a bridge, whatever you like. That's also possible. The right to inspection, does it come under the same law and exactly same format? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, if you read that booklet, see, it defines what is right to information. It includes inspection of documents. It includes inspection of works. It includes getting samples. All that is part of the law. I mean, I would need normally uh, to have a good workshop, I would need about six hours. You know, then I could take you through 
various provisions. Uh, so I'm only trying to give you a flavor of the act. But believe me, it's very simple. As you know, I'm an engineer. I'm not a lawyer. But this is a very, very simple act. You can, uh, if you go to the website also, you'll get a look at the act, read the act, read the rules. It's not difficult. It's extremely simple. And a chap like me at 56 can start learning it. Young people like all of you, starting at a much younger age and much smarter, will find it much easier to be able to use this. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, in case of public organizations that subcontract their works to a private entity, can we still pose the question to the public organization regarding the files of the private party which has taken up the work on behalf of Yes, ma'am. You can. You can. You can. Uh, the Act does not say what can be given. It says everything can be given except the exemptions. The word confidentiality has disappeared from the entire thing. The act is an act to give you information. There are 10 exemptions. Anything that does not fit in the exemptions has to be given to you. In fact, the act goes further. It says information which can be accessed by a public authority. Forget giving work. If let's say there is a private body and I ask a public authority and say you under the law can get this information from him. The public authority has to get it from him and give it to me. It goes further. There is an overriding Section 8.2, which says, notwithstanding all the exemptions of 8.1, 8.1 is the section by which information is exempt. Notwithstanding all the exemptions of Section 8.1, if there is a greater public interest, information shall be provided. So, it is weighted very, very heavily in favor of giving information. We need to work. We need to earlier ATM, Ahet Timbilel. If information exists, it has to be given. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't have to be given. They don't have to keep records to answer you. If IIT is keeping the record of my marks, then they have to be given. In fact, I, uh, at one, I, I uh, talked to a lot of government officers also. So at one central government organization, I was, had been called and then they said, Mr. Gandhi, somebody is asking 10 years old a record of who went in the guest house and paid how much money. So I said, do you have the record? He said, yes, we have it. I said, why do you have it? If you don't need it, why are you maintaining such a stupid record? Improve your record keeping. But so long as you maintain the record, you will have to give it because why do you have a record otherwise? If you say the record is necessary, that is your decision. Whether a record must be kept for one day, one month, one year, ten years, hundred years. Yes, but sir. then there should be some kind of a directory which says such records are maintained such periodicity, isn't it? Is that right? That, that is part of every organization's duty. In fact, there is a section 4 which says suo moto you must declare. All these things must be there. I mean, uh, any good organization should have all of these. But, and it's happened. Uh, to me, I had asked about names of political leaders who had recommended police transfers. So, uh, I asked for two years at that time and that's a running battle, that's a huge battle really. So, they ultimately after a lot of uh, going back and forth, they gave me one year. And they uh, that list said Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Deputy Chief Minister so many times, so and so, so many times, so and so MLA and so on and so forth. It was a who's who's list. So, I said what about the earlier year? So, they said we've destroyed it. Precise question I asked what you are raising. I said, what is your record keeping system? Right. Show me. And show me the register of destruction of records. Right. So first the police answered, they said, we don't maintain it. I said, tomorrow you will say, you don't maintain FIRs. You can't act lawlessly like this. So, I mean, you can pursue these things. These are things of records. But it will also help institutions remove records which they don't need. Because unnecessary records are kept, which serve no purpose whatsoever. Any other questions, friends? Yes. Something about the larger public good, uh, information can be denied in such a case? No, no. Will be given. And notwithstanding uh, all the exemptions, if there is a large public good. So those exemptions are noted down and they are fixed? That's, I, in fact, they have given in the booklet. I am not able to uh, go through these 10 exemptions. Okay. They are given in the booklet. They are given in the act. You can also take a look at the website, you will get the 10 exemptions. They are listed, specifically listed exemptions. 
uh, okay, I think we will probably have to bring a close to this. Uh, before I end, I would just like to end with a small story. Uh, this happened a few thousand years back. It was Amavasya, the day when no moon is there. Sunset time. People like to watch sunset. So, a lot of people had collected at the beach to watch the sunset. The sun was going down. There were hues of blue, orange, violet, red. It's a beautiful sight. And the sun kept going down and down and down and suddenly the rim was seen and the sun froze. People were watching 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes and they said, what's happened? Something's gone wrong. One little boy, he took courage and he asked, he said, oh Lord Sun, why have you stopped? You must go further. And the sun said, I am worried because today is Amavasya and if I go down, there will be complete darkness. A little lamp was there. He said, Lord, give me a spark. And if you give me a spark, complete darkness cannot occur. The Lord gave him the spark. Sun went down. There was little light. This lamp gave its light to the others. And that was the first Diwali.